Today's episode is sponsored by Blinkist. Blinkist is an app or a website where you can tap into some of the key learnings and the best need-to-know information from some of the best and most popular nonfiction books out there. I think everyone has those moments every day where you're sitting and you're waiting in the physio's office or the train to come or the bus to go. <laughs> it's starting to sound like a lot like Dr. Go Seuss in it, going to the waiting place. But uh, Blingers really does help those times become productive rather than just going on Facebook or Instagram or checking your notifications and friend requests on LinkedIn. You can actually access the best needs to know information from the best books of all time. So I've got it in my schedule and my routine. We recommend that you do it too. And you can test it out all for free with a free seven-day trial and we've arranged a special deal for just the What You Will Learn audience. So if you want to check it out yourself, head to Blinkist.com forward slash What You Will Learn. That's Blinkist spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com forward slash What You Will Learn for your free seven-day trial. Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins, a big man, wrote this bad boy 40 or 50 years ago and probably one of the most well-known science books, especially on this evolution going around. It's held up very nicely, even though it's 50 or so years old. In terms of evolutionary biology, I think this is the number one most influential book ever written. He calls this the selfish gene and critics of of the book and of Dawkins spin that out and say, oh, you're just saying that everybody's selfish, that everybody's just out for themselves. But Dawkins is saying, no, the genes are selfish in the sense that they're out for themselves. They want to propagate themselves. The genes want to live on and pass on their own genes. But he's saying that not necessarily humans are selfish in that sometimes it's actually a good strategy for the gene if a human is altruistic. So in this episode, we're going to cover the huge scope that is in the selfish gene. We're going to look at how something as simple as hydrogen at the very start of the universe evolves into something as complex as you as a human being. We can understand how survival machines compete with one another for scarce resources and all sorts of strategies that are contained within the different sexes. And as you were saying there, our show all about altruism as the strategy And then at the end, we're going to look at it from a marketing point of view, taking the analogy of the selfish gene and see how ideas evolve through culture. So in the beginning, before our species or any other species was roaming this planet, there was ultimate simplicity. Everything was very simple and it was through a long evolutionary process that we got to the level of complexity we're at today. But all of this complexity started with initial basic simplicity. Yeah, things were very, very basic, right? At the very start, you just had a bit of hydrogen as the only atom in the universe. So over time, things gradually went in the direction of stability. And hydrogen itself is not a very stable atom. It wants to change into different things and become more stable. And the way it does that, it brings two or more atoms together to form different molecules. So we might, we might call this like a little cocktail shaker. You mix up a bunch of stuff, you shake it around and when they settle down, the things that are going to survive the longest are the ones that are most stable. As you said, hydrogen is not stable so it clings and latches onto other different atoms and together they form a new molecule that is more stable. So these new molecules, they keep getting shaken in this cocktail shaker and even more complex and more stable molecules arise. Eventually you might have things like hemoglobin And when a group of atoms in the presence of energy falls into these stable patterns of ever more growing complex molecules, they tend to stay that way. And the earliest form of natural selection before the natural selection we know it, we're talking about physics into chemistry here, simply a selection of stable forms and a rejection of the unstable forms of molecules. I mean, there could have been these molecules we don't even know of today that were just brought into existence for just a tiny, tiny millisecond, but it went out of existence just because it wasn't stable. So we've got a bunch of atoms at the moment, but we haven't yet got the ability to make an atom, an (laughs) A-T-O-M to an A-D-A-M. So so whilst we're getting a little bit more complexity, we're still on the simple end of the spectrum. A human has, you know, a thousand million, million, million atoms in it we're nowhere near that point yet we're just slowly making our way through more and more complexity and we're taking a bit of our own artistic and creative license here we're saying this is kind of like phase one of evolution and it's the evolution of basic atoms into molecules 
And this phase one of evolution, it's not enough to, in the cocktail shaker, to make Adam at by Adam, Adam and Adam. Adam. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Whatsoever, right? There's a lot more complexity that you need. In the next phase of this development towards complexity, we know that we've got all these raw chemical materials floating around. We've got things like water, carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia. And what chemists have found now is that if you put some of these together in a flask and you add energy to it, you can create new things. So this is sort of what was happening. We're getting shaken up. All these things are mixing together. And with a, with a bit of energy, then we can form things like amino acids. So these amino acids are what the scientists say today. They're kind of like this primeval soup. You think about this soup as being something that is full of all kinds of building blocks that uh, allow for organic substances. And three to 4,000 million years ago, which is what, three it's to four long, long time ago, bil- yeah. billion years ago? Yeah, that's an easy way to say Because they didn't it. used to say billion <laughs> if, uh, a little while ago. But this is what was happening on the earth. So you had basically had these molecules supplied by energy and on earth, this energy and molecules created these amino acids and this primeval soup. And one thing that just happened, as we said, there's a whole bunch of different stuff happening and just by, by chance effectively, a molecule was created that could then recreate itself. And, and Dawkins calls this a replicator. So the replicator was a molecule that just by chance was able to recreate a new molecule that was the same as itself. So this seems pretty arbitrary and improbable and almost impossible, right? Like, but if you think about it, we're talking over the scale of billions of years. I mean, me and you, we're only here for 100 years. We're talking a scale of, I don't even know the math, but it's a ridiculous <laughs> a amount of lifetimes, right? So there's all kinds of different combinations that these atoms could create and these molecules mm. could create with this energy. They might have come up with a million different configurations and by chance just one of those configurations mm. had to be something that replicated itself for us to take us to the next step. Yeah, he says it's like if you bought a lottery ticket every single week for a billion years, there's probably a good chance you're going to win a couple of jackpots. So it's just by it's just by chance and just by probability that one of these little molecules could pop out and then create an, another version of itself. So this kind of molecule had to just come up once because once it's come up once, mm. it's going to repeat Makes itself. Second one. And it repeats yeah. itself. And at the very start, it's using this primeval soup to get its nutrients and resources to actually replicate itself. So you got one type of replicator who's got pretty much an infinite food supply at the very start to go from. So just to reset, so we start with the the atoms. They get mixed around in the cocktail shaker to form more and more complex molecules. And then in the second phase, we had one molecule that was able to replicate itself. So as we said, there's this big soup, a lot of energy, a lot of nutrients in there. This replicator's eating it all up and creating new versions of itself. And the next phase is you got replications, but there were slight errors. So the molecule replicates itself, but it's ever so slightly different to its original self. So all of a sudden, we've got this big primeval soup bowl and rather than just containing one type of replicator, it's got a variety of replicators because these replicators weren't perfectly replicating themselves. Mm. There's slight variations meant there was slightly different characteristics between all the replicating molecules. And now Dawkins was looking at this and thinking, so you've got a, a whole bunch of different replicators that are all replicating themselves but it's not possible that they can all be there forever. There's, there is a finite amount of, of nutrients and energy going around. So some of these replicators are going to be more successful than others. Some of them are going to be more likely to survive than others. And he gives a few criteria for the ones that were the most likely or the most advantageous to survive. The first characteristic is longevity. If you think about it, if you've got like one replicator that pops up and it pops straight back out of its existence... It's not going to, no. by definition, it's not going to be there for long. If the replicator, on the other hand, had the ability to survive a very long time, then obviously that's going to be more abundant in this soup. The second characteristic is the speed of replication. So if you think of it, if, if one molecule replicates itself once every day and then you've got another replicator that replicates itself once every hour, the one that is able to replicate itself quicker is obviously going to become far more abundant. The third characteristic it evolved was the accuracy of replication. So say if you've got replicator X and replicator Y and the first one changes itself shitloads every time, over time it's not going to be there because it just changes itself the whole time. So the other replicator might change itself a tiny bit and every hundredth replication there's an error. 
So the ones that have the least amount of error when they're replicating uh, become more numerous also. He gives a little bit of nuance here saying that we think that those errors is what causes evolution, but the gene itself doesn't want an error. The gene itself wants to perpetuate itself and wants to stay exactly the same. So the gene doesn't want to evolve in a sense. It wants to stay exactly as it is. So accuracy is a very important thing. So tying those all together, we've got the the replicators that have the longevity, they have the longest lifespan, they have the highest speed of replication, and they have the highest accuracy of replication with the least errors. They're the types of molecules and replicators that are then going to become the most abundant in this big sloppy soup that we've got. And if you give enough period of time, right? So at the very start, this soup, it's full of all the steak sandwiches that you could possibly mm. want as a little cheeky replicator going around. You've got this abundance of resources to tap into but eventually that abundance of resources is going to slowly and slowly become more scarce so originally it was just these three attributes that made it kick ass in the big soup but eventually there's not enough soup to go around so new characteristics had to evolve because there was this finite element to the amount of resources going around and those three characteristics of longevity, speed of replication, accuracy of replication, they were no longer enough because we're getting to the upper limits of what's in the soup. It turned out that the molecules that had specific attributes were now more able to survive. And one of those attributes would be a bit of ruthless selfishness, a bit of competition, a bit of basically the molecules carrying a sword around ready to chop some other people off just because that's how it, it came about. Yeah, it's not like they were consciously trying to kill and defeat people or anything like that. It's just that that attribute by chance was the one that's going to make them most successful. So over time, the ones that carried that became more abundant in this early soup in, in the early days. And over time, the ways of increasing stability of your own molecule and of decreasing your rival's molecules because you're, you're both you know, competing for the same resources, it became more elaborate and more efficient. So early days, one of them might have discovered and discovered being in parentheses because they didn't discover it. Again, it just happened to be the one that was the most successful attribute. How to break up the molecules of your rivals chemically and then you might have just eaten up all your rivals' food that it left over. And then, you know, you win in two ways. There's less rivals around and you're eating rivals' food. So, that's a pretty successful strategy. Yeah, it says that you could build like a little protective wall around yourself in a sense, meaning you become more stable or you could have the strategy where you can weaken your opponent's wall and make them less stable. These are just some of the things that, you know, by matter of chance, by a matter of probability, this happened to evolve in some groups of molecules and these were the ones that then became most successful. And over time, the methods that were most successful developed in different ways. So some replicators, for example, they started to construct themselves containers, so vehicles for their own continued existence. And the replicators that survived the best were the ones that had these best survival machines to preserve their genes. The first ones were they were just simple protective coat like a cell wall or something. But making a living steadily got harder and harder as the competition got more aggressive and new rivals came up with better machines. So the ones that were most successful had the best machine. And by chance, this is how evolution really started. So the question here is with these small gradual improvements from the, the cell wall to building up a, a slightly better machine or vehicle to carry yourselves in, he calls them the survival machines. They're getting bigger and more elaborate, but we're still talking about the cell level here. That they're, they're, they're tiny, tiny things at this point. But over time, over the span of billions of years and billions of billions of, of replications, what actually happens to these survival machines? What happens to the genes within themselves? What other uh, strategies develop as a way of perpetuating the gene? Given a long enough period, these survival machines they created went from being simple cell walls to things as complex as we see today. The animals we see around, your, your pet dog, your elephant you see at the zoo, the bird in the air, the whale in the ocean, these are all the survival machines that were created by these replicators. So the replicators today go by the name of genes. So what he's saying here, Astro, is you, you're just a big lump of selfish genes. Your whole purpose of existence is to replicate genes. How does that make you feel? That's it. The genes are the replicators and we're just their survival machines. And it was just the, the strategy. That was the winning strategy. The, the best way for the genes, the replicators to perpetuate themselves was to create humans as a survival machine. 
So it seems something that's kind of devoid of purpose, and you see why uh, it, this goes against a lot of the stories of religion. The the purpose of human beings is for you know a much <laughs> greater thing as opposed to just the survival of genes. You might think that you woke up this morning, you had your coffee, you're listening to this podcast now, you had breakfast, you chose your job, you're, you're just living your life. What the hell does anything like this have to do with genes? As if you're just a survival machine for these arbitrary tiny little things that make up your body. Of course, we all like to think that we have uh, consciousness and we all like to have free will and we have our own choices to make and we're not really dictated by these genes. It's not that everything we do every single day is is for the sole purpose of replicating our own genes but Dawkins used the analogy of like a, a chess computer in that a, a computer can beat the best human grandmasters in chess but the computer in the beginning was programmed by a human but it's not as if the human right now is still running that computer. Yeah, let's say if you got Susie, she's a computer programmer and she's trying to make up a program for a computer to just kick ass at chess and at the very start, she's writing all these different strategies and algorithms and all kinds of math to give it the best shot when it's unleashed to go out and beat human grandmasters and it's on its own. And now it's out on its own. It's playing chess. Susie can't jump in and just mm. start manipulating with the, the game. It's, it's on its own at this stage. So in the beginning, Susie did her best in setting up the computer in the sense that it told it the starting position, it told it the goal or the objective at the end how to win and then it set up you know the basic moves what can each piece do and it can give it a few sort of optimal strategies but because there are more possible games of chess than there are atoms in the galaxy she can't tell it exactly what move to make in every single situation she's basically giving it the basic ground rules and say hey here's a strategy and then after that point the computer's on its own so the analogy here Susie's your gene right so the gene is making all these algorithms in economically expressed terms to give you the best shot at replicating its genes. And when you're out on your own, you're out on your own now based on algorithms that have been implanted in your brain uh, from the genes design. So the genes effectively created our brain. At this point, our brain is making the decisions in a sense, but the decisions we're making is based on those initial guiding principles that were installed at the very start. We've got the program running in our brain. That program was coded by the genes and the gene said, here's the end goal, here's your objective, here's a few basic strategies from this starting point, here's what you should probably do. The genes can't jump in at any point and say, uh, no, don't do that, you should be doing this instead. The gene has just set us up and now we're on our own. Yeah, about three weeks ago, I got Subway and uh, was at the time you couldn't eat inside the Subway venue so I went to eat out, out in, a, in a park bench and for some reason, I think a lot of birds at the moment, they're getting all a bit ramped up and they were pretty wild that day and there was this one eagle just looking at me eating my Subway. And no, I, started, I think it was an eagle. A crow. A crow. Okay, yeah. It could be, yeah maybe Eagles. a pigeon or a seagull. No, no, it was a crow. It was a, crow. It was a, it was a, a crow, crow okay. or an eagle. Or, it wasn't you know, an eagle. <laughs> you know, I, mean, <laughs> I want to make it look uh, less, <laughs> make myself look a bit tougher than I probably was actually. <laughs> but yeah, this crow was kind of... <laughs> and it was staring at me in the eye and I was like, surely not. It's not going it's, it's to do anything. But it, it leapt up off the tree and just started just straight in my face <laughs> to go up my subway, right? And in that moment, my brain just like cracked into gear and dropped the subway on the ground and just ran away and just oh. let, and let this crow happen. It was on the middle of Clarendon Street, so there was a lot of traffic there. Fight or flight and you... You you flew, you took off. Well, that's <laughs> and right. You didn't fight back. That's exactly right, and that's <laughs> that's the brain having a economically expressed rule. And in the case of here, what the gene's done, it the gene itself doesn't have a reaction time like that, but it's programmed something in the brain when an eagle or something is coming <laughs> at your subway, just just drop it, and without yourself knowing it, you've moved on and you're surviving that. Yeah, and correct. Well, there the might be times where uh, if the if the eagle's coming at, there might be times when I have a go at fighting back against that, I'm going to call it an eagle. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it's probably I, like a little canary or something. Yeah. Something ex pretty harmless. Exactly. If an eagle's <laughs> going at some of a, a baby or something in mind that's carrying some mm. of my genes, then all right, we, we're on here. Yeah. But Subway, you know, I could go back, order a new sub, not worth the risk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so the gene has set you up to survive. You've, you've made all the trade-offs without even realizing you've made all these trade-offs in your head. You've weighed up all the costs and all the benefits, all the risks involved. And you've thought the subway can, the subway can go to the ground as long as this uh, crow doesn't attack me. 
So the the king eagle of the jungle, <laughs> the biggest eagle that's ever been in Melbourne. So in that case, the genes programmed itself. It was pretty hungry that day and yeah, it saw a big lumbering human there, but maybe in, in that lifetime, it didn't pose big risks. So I thought, all right, I'll wait up the stakes, the odds and the prize. So the stakes, I might, <laughs> I might have come across as a bit of a pushover. <laughs> <laughs> I think it could smell your fear. <laughs> smell my fear. I think it could as well when it was looking at me. I thought the odds and the prize, all right, I'm going to get a free subway. And in my brain, I'm like, all right, shit. You know, the state is a sub here. I lost half an hour and 15 bucks. Yeah. Um, the odds of beating the crow would be be pretty high, but I'm probably not going to risk losing <laughs> a couple of eyeballs for it. And, you know, the prize of that opportunity cost of not losing my eyes is kind of just leave the subway there and get out of here. Yeah, exactly. It's like every uh, it's like every gamble that you, you're always weighing up, you know, how much do you have to risk and what is your odds of success in order to get the prize? Obviously, the bigger the prize is, then the, the higher stake you're willing to put up or the lower odds you're willing to accept. Whereas if it's a small prize, you're not going to risk too much. For the... Uh, for that tiny little baby crow who just popped out of the egg that was was ready to attack you, then uh, the maybe you know there's no one around the city at the moment. There's probably not too many people walking around with their subway. Maybe it hasn't eaten for the last two days. So for the baby crow, then the prize was extremely high. For you, the prize is pretty low because you can just go and get a new subway. So the genes have come up with all kinds of strategies that give the best odds that your survival machine will allow for the genes replication. Now, imagine if one survival machine could come up with something where it simulates exactly what might happen in reality and it could go through hundreds of different simulations to work out what the odds are and the costs and the and the stakes again, rather than just going through trial and error every time and just having to, in my case, fight the eagle <laughs> to you know find out why. The trial and error is a, is a pretty risky strategy because if you... Uh, if you weigh up the stake, the odds and the prize and you think, yeah, I'll have a crack and you make that bet, if you lose, you're cooked. Your genes are done. So it's obviously much safer and much quicker for you to actually simulate rather than take the risk and do the trial and error. If you can simulate all of those possible outcomes, it's a much better strategy. Now, the survival machine that comes up with this strategy of simulation probably is going to be the most successful survival machine on the planet. Mm. And what Dawkins is saying here is us human beings... We were the first survival machines to come up with this strategy of simulation and what he's referring to as simulation here is what we now today know as consciousness. It's a pretty speculative bet, isn't it? The, it's a thing to say that consciousness is purely a strategy created by the gene to replicate themselves. It's a big call. It's a big call. But if you think of it, say there's a, a little a, a deer living in the woods and it wants to go down to the lake and get a drink. It's very thirsty. But it knows that there's predators, there's a big lion lurking around the watering hole. If, you know, one strategy might be to wait really, really long and hope that the predator goes away. One strategy might be to run and get a quick gulp and run back because it knows that if it, if it just goes down there and keeps its heads down and have a, has a long drink, it's probably cooked. But you know that every time it does that little trial and error, there's a big risk it could get wiped out. Whereas if we're, for us humans, we're able to simulate all those different outcomes. If we can think far ahead, if we can think, here's option A, option B, option C, here's the risks involved, here's the prize at the end, here's the stakes, we're much more likely to survive than the, the deer who's about to get eaten by the lion. You might be thinking right now, all right, I'm not purely selfish, right? Like I'd, I'd probably die for a few members of my family or I might, or my mother would definitely die for me, especially when I was an infant. So, how does this explain through selfish gene theory? So, the, the book, the title that people like to spin, you know, the selfish gene saying everybody's just selfish out for themselves, that's not true. The genes are selfish. That doesn't necessarily mean that us humans have to be selfish. And in fact, in some cases, being altruistic and helping other people is actually a very good strategy. So, our genes uh, have, as you know, using us as the survival machines, we've developed some great survival strategies. One of these being what he calls kinship or altruism. So you think about it, you're a gene who's programmed a survival machine. The same genes that are in you are in some of your relatives and kins. For example, your brother or sister share half your genes because when your parents got together and they made sweet, sweet love, they share the genes to create the kids. So you also share half your genes with your mother and half your genes with your father. Go another layer beyond that your grandparents, you share a quarter of your genes with and then 
your uncle, it is a quarter, your cousin, it's one eighth. And then you get to about the point of the third cousin, which you're sharing about one 128th of a gene. Yeah. So, by that logic, because our genes want to survive, we recognize that we're closer. There's more of our genes inside of our, our brothers and sisters and our parents. There's still a, a pretty high amount of genes in our, in our grandparents and our uncles and aunties. Our cousins are pretty close as well. By the time you get beyond that third cousin, there's probably less of a, less of a kinship there. But because your genes in you are the same in your family members and the genes want to survive, you're going to do things to help out your family members. So the gene being selfish does explain kin altruism. If a gene out there and is programmed to suicidally kill itself to f- save five cousins and one third cousin you don't really give a shit about, <laughs> that's not going to be very numerous in the population. Exactly, because there's only if there's one eighth of the genes and you know you can save five cousins, the math doesn't work out. And then you go on the other hand, if a gene is out there saving five brothers and ten cousins and throwing a your grandpa George on top, <laughs> it's actually my grandpa's name. I don't know. It's my middle name as well. Grandpa George in the mix. All of a sudden, this suicidal altruistic gene would become more numerous because it's saving more of its genes in its population. And another element, rather than just the raw numbers of the you know the half, the quarter, the one eighth, all that sort of stuff. On top of that, the other layer is also the likelihood of survival. Like, say, for example, your uh, grandmother. You know, we share a quarter of the genes, but because your grandmother has less potential future life ahead of her than you do, she's probably willing to do more things for you. Or the same as your your mother has a strong tie to the child, even though there's only half the genes, the mother's already reproduced. The, the goal of the mother is to bring up the child in a way that they can then reproduce. Yeah, it's interesting in the book, he explains like why would something like menopause uh, evolve in women, right? Like they could just keep on having more and more children and creating more and more replicas of their genes. But as a strategy, what the genes have done is stop women at a certain age having their own kids and that means uh, by default, all their energy and resources goes to being devoted for grandkids because at that age, it's more likely genes are going to propagate if it goes into the new genes on the block. I think the math does add up, man. Like, uh, most people would say they would die for their brother and sister and yeah. stuff, but they probably wouldn't. You'd probably, <laughs> you'd probably die for two brothers <laughs> or, right, or one brother and one sister, so it's equal to your own genes. Yeah. Or you might, if you're a bit older, you might die for a very young brother or something. Yeah. Or like my niece, she's very, very young, so I'd probably factor in the youth. Yeah, but it's still only a quarter there, so she'd have to be four times as likely to reproduce a new. Yeah, now let's. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Like, I'd probably say I would, but then if push came to shove and I had to press a button, <laughs> who knows, right? Who according, knows? To, according to Dawkins, I, it would be a, va- a bad evolutionary strategy yeah. for me to uh, die altruistically in that circumstance. <laughs> That's it. So, how we relate with our family members is, is one important strategy of the gene survival. Another important strategy that comes about is the differences in the sexes. So, obviously, to make a Uh, To reproduce, you need half of a male and half of a female. They need to come together and the the sex cells need to join up. The egg and the sperm need to get together and create a baby. From the point of view of biology, one group of individuals have got large sex cells and it's convenient to use the word females for them and it's not just for uh, animals and stuff. They use it for cells as well. And one group has very small sex cells and they are males. So sperm and eggs, they contribute equal number of genes, but they act very differently in cultivating those genes. So the eggs are the ones that contribute far more in the way of food reserves and compare that to sperm, they make no contribution at all beyond just transporting the genes just to the egg and then the sperm's done its job completely. So if you think about it, then a father and a, and a mother, the uh, it's half of each person is inside the child and because both people have a vested interest in in propagating their genes. They want to both invest in the success, you know, of, of upbringing that that offspring. But then, as you mentioned, one part of the genes, the the egg or the the mother or uh, or that side of the equation, 
there's a lot of extra energy invested and say in, in a human it takes nine months where the the mother can't then be having more children whereas the father could be going off and, and uh, creating a million sperm every day finding new and new different sexual partners and making more and more offspring so if you think about it the female is tied down to to one person for a long period of time and it takes a while before they can have another baby whereas the other half could go around and have a new partner every day and make more and more and more offspring so the number of children a female can have is limited. The number of children a male can have, in one sense, it's virtually unlimited. So you might think that males are pretty worthless fellows, right? Like for the good of the species, you might just have one bloke and thousands of women and then that bloke's sperm just gets distributed to them all. And from the good of the species, it's going to be very successful over time to have this uh, the super male, in a sense, serving all the different females and getting them all pregnant. So males, in that sense, they're kind of expendable. You can just get mm. rid of them and you can just have one bloke to an island of women and, and things would keep going. It'd be different if you just had one female to mm. a whole group of blokes on, on an island. So in that sense, the female is, is far more important because you need more females and you, by proportion, you need significantly less males. So you think back to that island analogy, if you've got one bloke to an island of 100 females, that one bloke is going to be so bloody successful, his genes are replicated a hundred times. So it'd be pretty good to be a bloke on that island. So you might have two, three, four, five males. And because of that, the males being ultra successful, it actually balances back out. So it's a 50-50 ratio to the point where the odds of your genes being replicated is equal whether you're female or male as a 50-50 split. So that's what Dawkins calls an evolutionary stable strategy in that if there was ever far too many females, the males become more valuable and then in, that means that males would increase. If it ever goes the other way where there's less females, the females become far more valuable and that equilibrium always balances out to that 50-50 ratio. The pendulum's always swinging back and forth but ending up in the middle. Now, one other part of it is that as we mentioned, the investment required from the mother is far greater than the investment required by the father. So there are some strategies that the females use to make sure that they're picking the right father. They don't want to pick a male that is then very quickly going to leave them to bear all of the costs of child rearing to themselves. They want to make sure they're picking a male that's going to stick around long term and balance out the costs. So everyone wants as many children as possible to spread out more genes. And the female has a lot more to lose than the male does. The male just gets rid of the sperm and can move on, whereas the female's left with the sperm. So it'd be a very good strategy if the female is very careful about the male she might actually choose to, to be with. So at the very start, she might go through periods of time to kind of test the male's willingness to hang around and his domesticity and the odds of him leaving are very low because if she thinks the, the bloke's just going to run away and uh, leave her with the, all the burden, then she's not going to choose that person. She's going to choose the, the male who she's sure is going to hang around with. Because if we, if we look at it, say there's a, a year investment from a female to create a baby, that's a big investment and then the mother is very invested in the success of this child. They, they want to bring it up, they want to look after it uh, because it's, going to take, it's a, a much greater investment to create that baby and they want to make sure that it survives. Whereas the male, it's, you know, in a sense, it's easier to move on and just create a new baby. So what the females are effectively doing is increasing the investment from the father. So say if you, you're playing hard to get, and say you, it takes six months of courtship in order to woo a female, that means it's six months that you're already invested into this. It's not just the, the one and done, see you later. Mm. You've already put in the big investment. And also, if you know that if you leave this female and try to go to another female, it's going to take you another six months, you already know that there's a big investment required in order to get that child. Yeah, so this female coyness, it's common amongst all animals and it explains a lot, I think, if you're, if you're single and you go to the bar as a as a bloke and usually the blokes just they just go straight up right like you, a lot of the time you <laughs> for most blokes out there the barrier to choosing a sexual partner is a lot lower i'd say than a lot of females for a lot of females they're a lot more careful about who they choose to go home with for <laughs> very good reason but i think it is explained a little bit by this evolutionary biology 
obviously that's a uh, very heteronormative approach for us to be taking, but we're just talking in the the scientific evolutionary side of things when we're talking about the the male and the female and the and the, the coming together and creating new life and stuff like this. And as we mentioned, that the female strategy there is to to play a little harder to get to make sure that she is selecting the right father. And now the males have also developed strategies as well. And it turns out that aggression is one of these important strategies for males to cultivate. So remember, females are the things that are scarce. Males are the ones that are expendable. So between males, aggression might arise. Just so they kick the other male's ass and then they end up sticking sperm in the female's egg. <laughs> that's a crass way to put it, but that's, I guess that's what it is at the Just end of the day. Happens, <laughs> so because the males need to compete with other males in order to show their worth to get the females... But if you just think that it's all out aggression, all out attack and males are always fighting each other, one of them is going to come off second best or potentially they both will. If it's a fight to the death and one person's gone or if it's a, a battle that's very close and both come off significantly injured, that means aggression is, is a good strategy in some sense but it's not always a good strategy for everybody to be aggressive all of the time. Yeah, in one sense you want to get rid of the other other blokes so all the females are left with you but in the other sense you don't want to go and just get in a fight where you're just going to risk your own death because you're going to lose your gene again. So it gets pretty complex in terms of a cost-benefit calculation mm. about how you handle aggression. He gives us the idea of the hawks and the doves. So let's say the hawks are the aggressive types that fight and the doves are the more calm types that don't want to fight. He actually did a little side note saying doves are fucking aggressive as fuck, but <laughs> everyone thinks doves are nice and peaceful. So let's, let's continue that analogy. So he says if a hawk meets a dove... The hawk knows it's going to fight. The dove knows the hawk is going to fight. So the dove is going to quickly run away. Neither of them gets hurt. If a hawk fights a hawk, so two fighters come together, either one of them is going to die or they're both going to get seriously injured. If a dove meets a dove, there's going to be a bit of posturing, but they both realize neither of them want to fight. So in the end, they're both going to go away unhurt. If, if you think about what's the best for the species as a whole, you probably have a whole bunch of different doves. It means mm. no one's attacking each other to an extent where nobody's getting hurt but then in that scenario all it takes is one hawk if one hawk jumps in there it can fuck up all of the doves mm. because it knows that nobody else is going to fight and one hawk can then just wipe out the whole species so it's actually not stable for there to be all all doves with a small number of hawks you actually need a range of hawks to all fight each other and to recognize that there are costs of fighting and this is where the idea of the evolutionary stable strategy comes in by Maynard Smith. There might be a bit of oscillation between a stable ratio between the species, what is going to be the most successful amount of doves to hawks. It might actually be uh, five out of 12 of the population are doves and the other seven out of 12 are hawks. And to that extent, the ratio is perfect given the costs and the benefits. That's it. Because if there's too many hawks that are then all fighting each other and killing, the doves actually become more valuable because they're just going to run away. They're never going to get hurt or injured. And then, as we said, if there's too many doves, the hawks have an advantage because they can just fight them all. So it always balances out. That pendulum always swings back to the, the evolutionary stable ratios. I think it plays out in your everyday life a little bit. If you think about it, if all the petrol stations out there, they were to collaborate as if doves and they weren't meant to fight with each other they'd probably be able to jack up their prices all together yeah. and win more resources out of all of us plebs like going to the petrol <laughs> browser but then <laughs> again all it takes is just one hawk to cut their prices down and beat all the other doves mm. and they're going to beat all the other doves out there and all of a sudden there might be two hawks and then you're better off being a <laughs> hawk so again it, it, it gets a, a stable strategy of people who are trying to rip you off to the ones who are acting <laughs> like doves Correct, correct. And then, okay, so we've got to this point. It actually gets even more complex after that because then you start to get all different kinds of strategies. You might get a, a dove pretending to be a hawk or a hawk pretending to be a dove. You might have a hawk that's out there that knows that you know it can fight, but it doesn't want to start a fight in case it comes up against a hawk and loses. So it's going to pretend that oh, I'm a nice, sweet little dove, but if someone attacks it, it's ready to fight back. You've got then all of these different strategies that evolve. You know, I remember seeing some people growing up at a party, the ones who are all fine, they get, <laughs> get all angry at people. And then as soon as someone is a hawk, it goes back. All of a sudden, that person <laughs> who's super dove. aggressive, they're, they go to dove mode. But it's a pretty successful strategy by them, right? Because most of the time, they're being a hawk and nobody wants to mess with them. Yeah. And then you might have someone who is a hawk to the hawks mm. strategy, but then rah, 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 and then, you know, 
a bit of back and forth and then they <laughs> run away, right? So it does get pretty complex and it does play out like this in as human beings. And it probably explains why the poker face evolves where you're acting and you're putting on a bit of a mask to act like something can hide your true feelings of what you'd really do as being the best strategy. So we've been talking about only one specific type of replicator up to this point and that is the gene. We've been talking about how the genes replicated, how they built survival machines, us humans, to uh, to propagate themselves and then the different strategies that evolved of genes. Now taking this idea and this application one step further, there's actually a new kind of replicator that has evolved on planet Earth. It's something that's staring us right in the face. It's still in its infancy and it's sort of drifting around in its own kind of soup, but it's achieving this evolutionary rate of change that's actually even quicker than the original replicators of the genes. The soup that we're talking about is human culture and the replicator is the meme. So memes are things like tunes, music, ideas, catchphrases, clothes, fashion, ways of making pots, ways of building skyscrapers, designing iPhones, anything like that. So as genes propagate themselves in the gene pool by leaping from body to body via sperm and egg, memes propagate themselves in the meme pool by leaping from brain to brain. This broad sense, we can call it imitation. He says that it's it can be pronounced mem. But uh, let's go with meme. Love, yeah. it, love a good meme. <laughs> One of my favorite things to scroll through uh, through the social media and check out all the funny memes. But we're talking about the, the memes at a higher level, a meme in the sense of an idea. So when you plant a fertile meme into your mind, he says it's like uh, it parasitizes the brain. It takes over the brain. Similar to the uh, a virus that parasitizes a gene's survival machine. When a meme jumps into a survival machine, then it takes over. So if you think about like this podcast, for example, or even this the book, The Selfish Gene, that in a sense is a meme and it is in our brain now and we're talking about it. So the culture is the podcast at the moment. And if you're listening right now and you like The Selfish Gene, you're going to tell someone else and tell someone else. So the most successful memes are the ones that actually catch on mm. and in a sense have word of mouth and have mm. different kind of attributes which are similar to the analogy of replicator earlier yeah that's it they replicate themselves so like the the gene the gene built the survival machine which is the human body the memes survival machine is a human brain and there is scarce resources just like the the soup from the very beginning there was scarce resources in our brain there's scarce resources there's only limited attention so the memes have to have ways of of battling it out to see which of the memes is going to survive Similar to earlier when the replicator was looking after longevity, speed of replication and accuracy of replication, very similar thing when we're talking about memes now. If you look at longevity, the ideas that last longest in the brain that are retained the longest have an advantage. So it's a little bit like the old uh, Lindy effect, the ones that last mm. the longest and are applicable across different periods of time, they're the most successful. The ones that are like little cheeky fads and fashions that pop up once and never come back, obviously, mm. they're not very successful memes. Exactly. And same goes for speed of replication. So, similar with the genes, the same thing with the memes. If it can spread quickly from one brain to another, that meme's got a great advantage and is going to be far more likely to survive. The third is the accuracy of replication. If we think of the selfish gene right now, in a sense, we're replicating the mm. idea, but we're going to have a little bit of errors. We're going to pop a bit of our own narrative <laughs> about what the book is all about. And if we change it too much, that meme's not going to be f successful. So it's kind of like when you package an idea or anything like that, you need to make it very easy for the next person to pass it on. If it isn't very easy to pass it on and they change it a little bit every time, that's not going to be a good meme. If you think of uh, one massive meme from about a decade ago and that's a big man sire, Gangnam Style, man, that spread like wildfire. The speed of replication of that was uh, s seemingly exponential. But if you look at the longevity, it hasn't survived that well, has it? Mm, sort of it broke hasn't. down a little bit. One of the best and longest surviving memes of all time is the idea of God. That's been lasting for, for thousands of years and that's stuck around pretty well. Yeah, it's had longevity for a long time. It hasn't really died. It's something that's come up across all kinds of cultures. And something that's common in this meme is the idea of faith. It's kind of the idea that you're not meant to bring any practical analysis to the idea of God or anything in the Bible. It's kind of metaphysical beyond your understanding. And because of that, it has 
a lot of survival value against rationality and practicality over the centuries because this idea of faith kind of overcomes that idea and that's why it's been able to last so long. And then when you, if you think about the, the factor of the accuracy of replication, originally it was all word of mouth, people telling each other from one to the other. Probably as you tell the story, it changes a little bit each time. But when you get to the point of the, the Bible that's written down in physical form, that's the point from which the accuracy of replication goes through the roof because you can always point back, hey, this is what it's supposed to be. It's a bit harder for you to change it and adapt it and for that meme to replicate in a way that, that doesn't match the original. Yeah, there's been a little bit of a translation over the time of the Bible into different languages and all that, but it's still kind of written in this old authentic style that hasn't changed too much. We don't like change it to suit the the way we speak today. It's still that thy, thee, da, da, dee, da, Johnny did this, they are, they got An extra ST, an extra ST TH. There and, <laughs> yeah, don't, they don't translate in that sense. So its accuracy of replication has been very high. Then you think of speed of replication. If there's ideas that get passed on that that provide answers to some of the most troubling mm. questions we've got like what happens after death or why am I here and all these kind of things. This is something deep down we want to hear. So, if there mm. is something that answers that, that's going to spread very quick. So, religion, whether it's Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, Christianity, whatever it might be, all of them have longevity, speed of replication and accuracy of replication. I know Seth Godin talks about this a lot, you know, that speed of replication, that sneezing, that's where he talks about the, the purple cow. If you see a purple cow, you're going to tell somebody else about it. So, that's like you spreading that idea. That's going from one brain to the other. So, I'm sure if, you, if you've got a big question about life and what happens in life and then you find this religion gives me the answer, you're going to tell someone about that. Yeah, well, 100%. I think uh, throughout our books, all three are touched on in different ways of marketing. Like perennial mm. seller would touches on longevity. Mm. If you make a product that lasts the the test of time, it's going to increase in value the older it gets or even accuracy of replication. I think the idea of writing a book means it's something that this idea is packaged once and it's not going to get mistranslated over the years. The idea will hold its form the whole time. Now, this book's had pretty wild scope explaining how we got to here, uh, giving us a lens of evolution that it goes, I think, beyond what Darwinism did. So, at the start, we had hydrogen as the only elements in the universe. Over time, or a very, very long period of time, this evolved into more stable molecules, which grew more and more complex over time. These stable molecules were around on the big lump of metal that we're on today, which is Earth. And about three to four billion years ago, this was provided with a lot of different sun and energy and nutrients, kind of like a cocktail shaker. So, because there were so many different types of molecules that were forming in this cocktail shaker in all, all these different arrangements, it just so happened, just by the law of large numbers and a, a little bit of probability, that one of these molecules that popped out actually had the ability to replicate itself. So, Dawkins called these the replicators and the replicator, the thing that uh, reproduces itself and we found that because there was, you know, there's because there was a finite amount of energy, and there was all these different replicators fighting for survival. It turns out the ones that had the longevity, the ones that could last the longest without being broken down, the ones that had the speed of replication, the ones that could reproduce themselves quicker than others, and the ones that had accuracy of replication, so they could reproduce themselves without error. These were the types of replicators that won. So there was a scarce amount of resources in these this early primeval soup. Over time, these replicators, which Dawkins uh, named the genes, invented survival machines. At the very start, these were things like just cell-bodied walls so another replicator can't come in and just take all your resources and, and kill you. Other types of replicators got better at attacking and tricks and counter-tricks kind of co-evolved to the point where we've got the biodiversity that we have today and... All the survival machines that we see everywhere, you're a survival machine as a human, your dog, it's a survival machine carrying its genes. The whole purpose of existence is to preserve the genes that are in your body. So, if we look at ourselves as a survival machine now and we think, well, who's in control? Is it the selfish gene that just wants to propagate itself or is it us as the survival machine making the decisions? And Dawkins used the idea of the chess computer. Susie the programmer programs in the rules, programs in the different moves that can be made and after that point, the chess computer runs itself. Because Susie doesn't know every single scenario that could pop up, it just needs to put in the basics in an efficient way so that the computer can make its own decisions based on those core rules. 
Similarly for us, our genes have programmed us, our human brains in a way that it says, hey, if you see this, then do the next thing. The genes can't predict exactly what's going to happen, but it's just given us these ground rules and then we're on our own after that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's come up with all kinds of ways and strategies to make sure the gene propagates itself the best. So the gene is selfish for itself, but it might make the survival machine you altruistic, especially in the case of your siblings or parents or anything that shares your genes. The most successful gene might be the one that commits suicide in service of more genes in the other survival machines, which is pretty funny. And remember that this is like all, all bets. Everything you do, you're weighing up the, the costs and the benefits. You're weighing up the stake, the odds and the prize. So one, the old way of doing it is you're going to have to take the risk through trial and error. But of course, if you lose that bet, you're wiped out. So what was developed as a strategy was consciousness and the idea to simulate all the different potential outcomes and work out what's going to be the best payoff. So the replicators, our genes have come up with all kinds of strategies and obviously human culture is something that's just gone to another level beyond what the replicators were and our culture is this primeval soup of what it was for the replicators billions of years ago and the new memes floating around today, uh, the tunes, ideas, catchphrases or podcasts like this that you're listening to right now. So just the ways like the genes propagated and replicated themselves by a sperm and an egg coming together to go from body to body the memes the ideas are propagating themselves in the human brain by spreading from brain to brain the most successful memes in our meme pool are the ones that got longevity and a perennial the ones that have a high speed of replication and move on easy it's pretty easy to just hit download on this podcast <laughs> which it. is pretty fast and three is the accuracy of replication. It's not going to change every time too much when it gets passed on. So that was the uh, the the five hundred page book in a one hour episode in a two minute recap. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a it's a wild book. Yeah, the scope is is huge, very very big. And I think a lot of people will look at this book and go, "Oh, yeah, it's just saying how we're all selfish." But I, I think you can look at this from an altruistic point of view by better understanding gene selfishness. We can set up our systems. So we all benefit better because in reality, if we all are doves and we're not fighting each other in a certain sense and trying to kill each other like a hawk would, we can actually make a conspiracy of doves because we've risen above what the gene is now and, and we've moved into that meme kind of level. If you enjoyed that episode, The Selfish Gene, and you want to help us propagate this meme, go out and share this episode with your social network and tag us in.